let's jump in and take a look at the software. Um, you see it on the screen right now. Um, what you see here is what you would first see when you launch the Modelogic software. So from my desktop, if I launch this software, and just to give you an idea, pretty typical, I might be here in Kent, Washington. Um, I might be working for a multi-office company, and our corporate headquarters could be in Chicago. And it could be that the corporate server is in Chicago, and our Modelogic database that actually stores our cost experience is located on that server in Chicago. And yet, I'm hitting it from my desktop in Kent, Washington, and I'm, I'm doing that through Citrix or Terminal Server. Um, as you can see, this is a desktop solution. It's, it's not a web architecture. Um, I, I would argue that today, because of the speed and performance that you're about to see with the software, you'll see that that's actually very advantageous to, to kind of the overall performance of the system. But being able to use this in a thin client environment, I would say almost every one of our customers uses Model Logics in a thin client environment. So this is the home page. A little bit about the navigation here. We think it's pretty straightforward. Most importantly, the five things that you would most frequently do in Model Logics are listed at the top of the page. So you would actually, maybe as an administrator, be pointing to an estimate that was created in WinEst and importing it into the backend database so it becomes one of the projects that's listed in your project database over here on the left-hand side. Or you're bringing a project in from Microsoft Excel because maybe you're bringing that in from another estimating tool or you're bringing that in from your project management software. Um, you could be bringing it in from, you know, Vico as an example. I might be taking an estimate that was created in Vico, bringing it in. I might be bringing it in from Tecla. I might be bringing it in from my project management software, whether it be ProLiance, Prolog, or maybe it's another estimating system like MC Squared or Timberline or US Cost. Doesn't really matter. Every one of those tools has the ability to publish a report out to Excel, and as long as I can do that, I actually have the ability to create a template and import that data regardless of the tool that authored that cost. In addition, right from the home page is where I can go to actually create a cost model. And we're going to talk a lot more about that here in a few minutes. I can search my database of projects. This database, for some customers, could be 100 projects. Other customers might be 1,000 projects that they've got stored in their Model Logics database. So we'll talk about the search capabilities as well. And then last but not least, after I've created my cost model, I want to be able to create a proposal or a report and generate that report and deliver it to the client or internally, if, if I need to deliver that report maybe to the chief estimator for review, I can do all that here by creating an unlimited number of uh, report designs. Okay, under the navigation pane, the home page, of course, is what we're looking at right now. We're going to talk a little bit more about setup in just a minute and then searching the database. Below that, though, you see a list of budgets or models, call them cost models, that I'm currently working on. So these would, be, these would be models that I personally am in the process of, of working on. Model Logics allows me to work with those models, edit those models, work with those cost models, and have them be private to me as an individual user, or I can make those models public so that other users of Model Logics can also have access to those, those budgets that are currently being worked on. So I have, I have an option to be both private and public with those models. The same is true of report design. So I can have report designs that I've created that are exclusive to me, or I can choose to make those report designs public so that other users of Model Logics can have access to those. And then underneath, this would be my unfiltered list of all the projects that I brought into the back-end database. One of the things, too, as we go through this, this example, I'm going to be using kind of a commercial construction example, but I notice from the list of registrants, we've got people uh, that are commercial, GCs, we've got some oil and gas folks, so we've got people in that energy field. The, the type of data and the types of projects that you store in the back-end database really doesn't matter. All that really matters is you've got cost, and that cost is organized by some sort of common work breakdown structure so that you can actually analyze the model. Having said that, 
we'll, we'll dive a little bit further. So when I talk about monologics and show it to people, there's a couple setup uh, uh, options that I like to kind of review with people very, very quickly because I think it lays the foundation for, for looking at the entire system. If I click on setup, first and foremost, and, and I would say this is a critical, uh, most importantly, I'll say kind of administrative piece of model logics, and that is when I bring projects into model logics into that backend database and all the cost behind those projects, that's not enough. What I want to be able to also do is apply certain key attributes to each of those projects so that those projects become highly searchable. Think of a wall of three-door filing cabinets, and if I had a thousand projects in those, those filing cabinets and somebody said, find me five you know, uh, uh, retail projects, between 100 and 250,000 square feet where the exterior shell of the building was tilt up concrete and so on and so forth, uh, between two and four floors, you know, on and on and on. You know, you, you look at that and you think, how quickly could I put my hands on those projects? Well, in a manual environment, that would take some effort. With model logics, using these project attributes that you see here, which we call smart categories on the screen, I could put my hands on those projects in a matter of seconds. The key about smart categories or project attributes is they are unique from company to company. So there's no limit to the number of project attributes you can set up, and it's absolutely understood that each company is going to have their own attributes, their own way of searching the database for the projects they're looking for. I have a simple example set up where, as a, as a general contractor, I, I might have one of my attributes represent the certain industry segment that a that a given project is associated with. Within an industry segment, if I expand that out, like I might, I might apply an attribute to a project that is a healthcare project. Within that attribute, I want to further get into additional attributes, like what was the interior gross square footage, number of floors, number of beds, you know, the exterior skin of the building, what was the material makeup of the shell of that building. And these are just I always tell people physically setting this up in model logics is a snap. Obviously, you're going to have a much longer discussion around the boardroom table about what attributes you want to use to organize your projects in the model logics database. Now, when you have questions like number of beds for a healthcare project, you can see that the response over here to the right, when I set this up, that's going to be just a numeric response. Nothing fancy about it. How many, project, how many beds did this healthcare project have? When you get to things like the exterior skin of the building, I actually have the ability to say, that's going to be a multiple choice answer, and I might go ahead and build a list of all the possible shell types that we work with. The value there is I can really preserve data integrity because I don't want to one day apply an attribute where I abbreviate the word concrete and the next day I don't abbreviate the word concrete, making my search criteria less effective. So all of that is under control. The other thing that we learned when we built this, this tool from talking to customers who attempted to build a, a similar application is it's important that certain attributes be applied to projects before they're available to be used in a cost model. And you notice here it said, input to this smart category is required. That will force people to actually respond to these attributes so that I don't have a bunch of projects in my database that don't carry the appropriate attributes that allow me to search for those projects. Everybody has a lot of pressure to move from one project to the next. and without some of these requirements, it can get really easy to start stuffing projects in the database that are not attributed. Here I can control all that. Okay, and you'll notice for corporate office, I can have things like building footprint. You know, I could have a whole series. You notice here it says, what's this total square footage of conference or open meeting room space for a corporate office structure? So your project attributes can vary based on the, the preceding attributes. So again, you can get very detailed here in terms of what things you want to capture. And you'll notice we can even support logic. You know, is there a parking structure associated with this healthcare project? If the answer is no, 
then I don't get asked any further attribute questions. If the answer is yes, I want to be prompted for things like number of floors, how many floors below grade, total number of parking places. The key here is all user-defined create as many attributes as you'd like. So you'll see how these come into play in just a minute. Another important setup with model logics is if the goal of this tool is to be able to reach into this database, grab a group of projects that are similar in definition to the limited scope that I have for a project that's currently in front of me, I need to be able to normalize the pricing in those projects forward to both a common date and, and ideally a common location. So I want to take those projects and treat them as if they're all built at the same date. And if this project's in San Francisco, I want to take all five of these projects and treat them as if they were a healthcare project, for example, built in San Francisco in 2014. Then I have a real apples to apples modeling capability. And you'll notice here, you can get very detailed with your inflationary index, or you can keep it at a very high level. It's, it's again, it's, it's at your discretion. You'll notice here my, my normalization index, costing index, dates back to 1990. A key concept here is I would certainly want my inflationary index to date back to the oldest project that I intend to bring into the back end depth, you know, model logics database, because that's the oldest project whose cost I need to bring forward. So not only can I have an inflationary uh, index to deal with time and inflation, I could also create a location-based index that allows me to account for the fact that, you know, that, that healthcare facility in, in San Francisco is going to be considerably more expensive than it would be in Omaha, Nebraska. And so you need to be able to take those projects, regardless of where they're located, and normalize the pricing. This tool allows you to do it. You can, an administrator could manually keep this inflationary data up to date, or we have, a, um, we have an import option. So you may have access to this data from an external source. Uh, McGraw-Hill, for example, on construction.com, they publish inflationary data. I believe it dates back like 50 or 60 years. Turner, on the Turner website, has the Turner Cost Index. So they, they have an inflationary index. So it's possible to get an external source and actually update this electronically instead of manually updating this. Okay, some other just last minute things. When I build a model, the work breakdown structures that are available to you to model from, whether it be CSI division like you see here, or a uniformat code, or like a system view, this is all user defined. However you break your cost down within your projects at your organization is what's available to you to model from. And you'll see how this comes into play in you know, shortly. 